Last week, we took a deep dive into the ten episodes that started it all, Game of Thrones Season 1. We heard all about how the debut season was a smashing success, but what would that mean for Season 2? Especially after the shocking loss of Season 1's leading man, Sean Bean. Think you know the whole story? Think again. I'm It's Just Some Random Guy with Cinematica, and we're giving you the inside scoop on how the cast and crew behind Game of Thrones followed up their epic first season with even more brutality, blood, and mind blowing bombshells. Whether you're a die-hard fan or just wondering what all the fuss is about, we've got something for everyone as we count down the 107 facts you should know about Game of Thrones Season 2. Let's get started! Number 1. In an unprecedented move, HBO ordered the second season of Game of Thrones just two days after the series premiere, all thanks to the pilot's critical acclaim. Number two. Just like the first, series creators David Benioff and D.B. Weiss served as head writers and showrunners for the second season. Together they wrote six out of the ten episodes. Number three. Actor Peter Dinklage, who plays Tyrion Lannister, was given top billing in season two after winning an Emmy, a Golden Globe, and more for his incredible performance as the rejected but capable royal in season one. Bow down to the dink. Number four. Fan favorite Dinklage is the only actor that appeared in every episode of the second season. Number five. In order to afford the incredible scope of the season, notably the Battle of the Blackwater, Benioff and Weiss, quote, pleaded on bended knee, unquote, to receive a 15% increase in the season's budget, taking the budget for the season all the way up to $70 million. Number six. The $7 million per episode allowed creators to expand filming locations, adding Croatia and Iceland to their home base of Northern Ireland. Number seven, King's Landing was represented by the ancient Croatian port city of Dubrovnik, which is home to the most famous haunted island in the world, Doxa. Google it. It's real and it's terrifying. Number eight, producers also filmed scenes of Karth and Slaver's Bay around Dubrovnik, as the port's various landscapes can provide both an isolated appearance, Karth, and the appearance of a more bustling trade center like Slaver's Bay. Number nine, one amazing pain in the ass, Dubrovnik is an old, beautifully walled city. Unfortunately, that means there are no elevators, so any gear or set dressing had to be carried by hand up dozens or even hundreds of flights of stairs. Number 10. Speaking of exotic landscapes, the crew was allowed to shoot on actual glaciers in protected national parks in order to film the Night's Watch expedition beyond the wall. Number 11. Following in the footsteps of the first book in season, season 2 was based on the second book in the series, A Clash of Kings. Producers strayed a little from the book's story line, holding off on introducing certain pivotal characters like the psychotic Ramsay Snow until they were central to the show's plot. Number 12. In adapting Clash of Kings, producers altered age and ethnicities as well. For instance, Salador's son, the slick, savvy pirate, was white in the book, but played by African-American actor Lucien Masamati on the show. Hardcore HBO fans may recognize him from the number one ladies' detective agency. Number 13. For the second year in a row, Game of Thrones had the biggest cast on television with over 200 50 speaking roles. Number 14. HBO made its first new casting of the season with Natalie Dormer in the role of Marjorie Terrell. Audiences may recognize her as Anne Boleyn from Showtime's The Tudors. She joined Game of Thrones after her character on The Tudors was beheaded, so she's used to the gore. Number 15. The Greyjoy family expands this season as we meet Theon's sister Yara, played by the crazy, talented Gemma Whalen. She's best known for her roles in the films Gulliver's Travels and The Wolfman. Number 16. Yara was named Asha in the novels, but producers changed the character's name so she wouldn't be confused with Osha. If you remember, producers did the same with young Lord Robin of the Vale, changing his name from Robert so he wouldn't be confused with Robert Baratheon. We still managed to find something to be confused about, though. Number 17. Yara was first offered to British pop singer Lily Allen, who was the real-life sister of Theon, aka Alfie Allen. Number 18. Lily Allen turned down the role because of the light incest the part required. Allen said she felt uncomfortable because she would have had to go on a horse, and he would have, quote, touched her up and shit, end quote. Good call, Lily. Number 19. Ballantoy Harbor, the location where Theon Greyjoy returns to the Iron Islands in Season 2, is still a working harbor in Northern Ireland. Pretty impressive considering it was built in the 1700s. Number 20. The crabby and bitter Balan Greyjoy, Theon and Yara's father, is played by the incomparable Patrick Malahide, a Brit with over 113 credits to his name. King of the Ironborn has been around the block. Remember him from Billy Elliot? He played a crabby, bitter school principal. Typecast much? 
Number 21. This is important and will come into play later, so pay attention. The Greyjoys have a rich history as pirates and plunderers. Quellen, Balin's father, was a moderate who forbade plundering to keep peace with Westeros. But Balin reinstated aggression, strengthening his self-proclaimed kingdom. In the Game of Thrones, you win or you die, and you also reap what you sow. Number 22. One confusing aspect of this season was Balin's apparent hatred for Theon upon his return. Well, here's what's up. Balin lost his rebellion against King Robert Baratheon and had to retreat to the Iron Islands with his tail between his legs. And to keep him in check, he received the ultimate humiliation. His only surviving son was taken and given to Ned Stark as a sort of insurance policy against future attacks. Theon's return is a reminder of the massive, humiliating defeat that defines Balin's reign. Number 23. Let's stay upon the narrow sea. Irish actor Liam Cunningham was cast as Davos, a fan favorite from the novels for his self deprecation and fealty to Stannis. Cunningham was an electrician for years before trying acting in his late 20s. Number 24. Davos's last name is Seaworth, but his nickname is much more interesting. He's known as the Onion Knight because of his legendary smuggling of onions and other food that helped keep Stannis' army alive during a previous siege. This isn't really talked about on the show, but covered in more detail in the book. Number 25. The Onion Knight is missing the fingertips on his right hand. In the book, it's his left hand, but Liam Cunningham is left-handed, so it would have been a whole thing. Thing. This is a punishment for his past crimes of smuggling and was required by Stannis in order to earn knighthood for his current smuggling that kept Stannis' army alive. Number 26. The role of Melisandre is played by Carice Van Houten, a Dutch actress known for her roles both on stage and screen. She previously appeared in the movies Valkyrie and Repo Men. Number 27. Carice was originally offered the role of Cersei Lannister. Fortunately for Lena Headey and her fans, Van Houten was forced to turn down the role. She was in the process of filming a Dutch comedy when filming for Cersei's role began. Number 28. Van Houten is also a published pop rock singer. Though it's her passion, when asked if fans would ever hear Melisandre sing on the show, she laughed, yeah, but can you see Melisandre singing in a cave? Like, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, the night is dark and full of terrors. Let's go! To answer her question, uh, no. No, we, we can't. Number 29. Melisandre and Seaworth had a thing at one point. Well, not exactly. Cunningham had previously played Van Houten's lover in the 2011 film Black Butterflies. You know you're a true Game of Thrones fan if you're having a real hard time imagining such a pairing. Van Houten joked about this on Twitter, posting an image from the film and tweeting to her fans, Davos and Melisandre, don't say they didn't try, hashtag Black Butterflies. Number 30. British actor Stephen Delane joined the cast in season two as Stannis. US audiences might know him as Thomas Jefferson in HBO's John Adams. Number 31. Delane is also the father of actor Frank Delane. Harry Potter fans know and love Frank as the young Tom Marvolo Riddle, and he's previously appeared in Sense8 and Fear the Walking Dead. The Delanes also had the pleasure of acting alongside one another in the independent film Papadopoulos and Sons. Number 32. Gwendolyn Christie was cast as the righteous Brienne of Tarth. George R.R. R. Martin was so stoked by her casting that he broke the news himself on his website. Number 33. Christie joined the cast as a relatively unknown actress whose most recognizable credit at the time was the Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus. Number 34. To show producers she was serious about the role, Christie gave up alcohol and red meat, started drinking protein shakes, and underwent kickboxing, yoga, and stamina training exercises on her own. She says she packed on 15 pounds of lean muscle for the part. Number 34. The wardrobe department helped Christie transform into Brienne by creating armor filled with lines that distract the audience's eyes away from her hips in hopes of giving her a boxier, more masculine figure. Number 36. Christie stands at an astounding six foot three inches. She says while people used to approach her and say, excuse me, how tall are you? Christie says now they say, excuse me, are you in Game of Thrones? And that is delightful. I can die happy. Number 37. Christie does not know her age. No, we're not joking because we don't think she was either. She said no one knows, not even her mum, and that she's lost track. The verdict is still out, but IMDb lists the year as 1978. No month or day, though. Curious. Number 38. Christy was bullied as a kid for her unusual height and, in her own words, appearing a bit androgynous. She believes the role of Brienne can help others with similar experiences deal with their own pain and find strength in their differences. You go, girl. Number 39. For all the true HBO fans out there, here's something to chew on. TV critic Maureen Ryan wrote a fascinating piece about the links between Brienne of Tarth and Omar of Baltimore, as in The Wire. Despite being worlds apart, literally, she wrote that both are outsiders who live by a code for better or worse, and therefore make random acts of violence curiously attractive. Number 40. 
Hannah Murray filled the role of Gilly, Craster's daughter and Samuel Tarley's love interest. Murray was known at least to the Younger Thrones audience for her role in the hit television series Skins, the British cast of course. Number 41. Rose Leslie beat out a massive room of redheads to win over the role of Egret, Jon Snow's love interest. Leslie said her brothers and sister, huge fans of the show, freaked out more than her. Number 42. While Conan Stevens played the part for a couple episodes in season one, Ian White took on the role of Gregor Clegane in season two. White was no newcomer to the throne set. He had previously played a giant and a white walker in past episodes. Number 43. Standing above everyone at a great seven feet one inch, White is one of the tallest Game of Thrones cast members, and maybe people in the world? Number 44. Ian White had previously used his talents and height to take on the role of Madame Maxime in full body shots for the fourth Potter film, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Number 45. Before getting into acting, White was a professional basketball player. He played at the collegiate level in the States and then professionally in England, his country of origin. Number 46. Scottish actor John Stahl joined the cast in season two as Rickard Karstark. Stahl's previous film credits included Loch Ness and the Jimmy Boyle biopic, A Sense of Freedom. Number 47. Actor Tom Wlaschia was cast as Jacken Hagar. Wlaschia made headlines between seasons recently by suggesting Hagar and Arya's first meeting was not a coincidence. Post your theories in the comments. Number 48. One missing scene from the book is the weasel soup scene, wherein Jacken dumps a kettle of hot soup over the guards holding Arya, allowing her and others to escape. Number 49. Game of Thrones doesn't mind casting the occasional porn star, er, excuse me, adult film star. Sahara Knight was brought in to play a prostitute in Littlefinger's brothel and ends up with Bronn just before the Battle of the Blackwater. Number 50. Maisie D, another British porn actor, was also cast in the role of a prostitute, this one famously being on the receiving end of Joffrey's sadism. Number 51. Roy Dotrice, who narrates the Song of Ice and Fire audiobooks, was cast as Helene the Pyromancer in Season 2. Dotrice was originally supposed to play the role of Grand Maester Pycel in Season 1, but unfortunately, he became ill shortly before shooting began and was replaced by Julian Glover. Number 52. When Sarah McKeever first appeared in Game of Thrones as Stannis' slightly deranged wife Selyse in the Season 2 premiere The North Remembers, she had no dialogue and went uncredited. Due to time constraints, the production team wanted to wait to officially introduce the character in Season 3, at which point Sarah was out and Tara Fitzgerald was cast in the role. Sorry, Sarah. Number 53. The enormous and expanding world of the show required some fancy scheduling. Filming took place over the course of 106 shooting days, but required two completely separate crews working at the same time in different countries. The crews were nicknamed Wolf and Dragon. Number 54. All right, so let's get into the nitty gritty details. This season was enormous because we're seeing the full scope of just how many people think they have a claim to the Iron Throne, hence the book's title, Clash of Kings. Joffrey is trying to hold on to the throne, and the challengers are Stannis Baratheon, who has a good blood line argument, Rob Stark, who has revenge on his mind, but a weak claim, Balin, who has like zero right to the Iron Throne, but is gonna try anyway, Renly Baratheon, who does have some legitimacy, and finally the young upstart Daenerys Targaryen, mother of dragons and all-around badass. Number 55. Speaking of dragons, their names are Drogon, named after Khal Drogo, her dead husband, Viserys, named after her awful, miserable dead brother, and Rhaegal, named after her dead older brother. Symbolism alert, She's surrounded by her dead loved ones who have been reborn, so to speak. She's gonna be tough to beat. Number 56. Let's talk dragons. Actress Amelia Clark first has to play with a bright green blob on the end of a stick called a stuffy. This is removed and painted over with the CGI dragons in layers. First a skeleton, then muscle tissue layers for texture, and finally the finishing touches are added, making each dragon look colorful and dirty. Number 57. Creators of the effects is Pixamondo, based in Germany. Believe it or not, they studied young geese and bats with really big wings. I see it. A big question Pixamondo wrestled with, how do teenage dragons fly? They created wind tunnel simulations and ended up with a mix of eagle and bat movements, eagles for soaring and bats for taking off. Number 59. The first episode, The North Remembers, shows us the red comet that all characters can see streaking slowly above them. The comet is known as the Red Sword, a sign of the Red God, and emerged shortly after Daenerys's dragons were born. Number 60. Speaking of the Red God, the Red Priestess Melisandre becomes a major player this season, though her history is fleshed out in the books, not so much in the show. 
Here's an important fact, though. She is magic, but she is not infallible. While she can birth a ghost of Stannis, she cannot accurately see the future. More on that in future episodes. Number 61. The big point about Melisandre's rise is this. In her religion, the Red God is the only one who has the power to fight the ice-hearted hordes gathering to steal the world from the living. Without going into crazy tiny details, the show is setting up a battle between the hot and cold, dragons and white walkers, ice and fire. Number 62. Cushendon is the name of the rocky beach in Northern Ireland where Melisandre gives birth to the ghost of the still-alive Stannis. Confusing? Check out episode 5, The Ghost of Harrenhal. Also, check out Cushenden during the daytime. Way nicer. Number 63. Speaking of Northern Ireland, the Queen of England visited the set at Titanic Studios there. Unfortunately, she could not be persuaded to actually sit on the Iron Throne. Number 64. Another departure from the books. In episode 4 of the season, Garden of Bones, Daenerys brings her dying, collapsing Kalisar to the gates of Karth, and the Thirteen refuse to let her in. Why the change? No one is certain, but the effect of the scene is clear. Daenerys will not not be bullied no matter how weak she appears. Number 65. The Battle of Blackwater takes up the entire penultimate episode of Season 2. The enormous land and sea battle for King's Landing was so massive it cost HBO an additional $2 million, bringing the total cost of the episode to $8 million, the largest single episode budget in TV history. Number 66. The scene required over 250 extras and producers had custom ships and weapons and a new battlement the side of a castle built in the middle of nowhere to double for the shores of King's Landing. Number 67. Production of the episode required seven day weeks for an entire month. Number 68. According to producers, King's Landing was being defended by about 7,000 men, which pales in comparison to Stannis' attacking force of 200 ships and 20,000 men. Going into the battle, Joffrey's rule could very easily be coming to a brutal end. Number 69. Complicating matters, the director of the episode had to drop out due to a personal emergency one week before filming. He was replaced by Neil Marshall, who did such an amazing job he was brought back to direct the mind-blowing battle episode Watchers on the Wall in Season 4, but more on that in the coming weeks. Number 70. One fun change from the books. In the show, the battle had to take place at night for budgetary reasons. It's way easier to do CGI at night because viewers can't see much beyond the focal point of the scene. Also, flaming arrows look amazing at night, according to Benioff and Weiss. Number 71. Another massive change. In the books, Tyrion had an enormous chain constructed that would be raised to keep Stannis' ships stuck together when Tyrion's wildfire hits. Producers cut the chain, but kept the wildfire. Number 72. The wildfire Tyrion uses is a reference to an ancient chemical weapon known as Greek fire, which was a mixture of coal, tar, lime, and sulfur used in early gas chambers. Yeesh! Number 73. Why did Cersei ask for milk of the poppy? Well, according to the books, and hinted at on the show, she would drug herself should the Lannisters lose the battle in order to avoid beheading by Illyn Payne. Number 74. Remember from our last 107 facts on Game of Thrones Season 1 that George R.R. R. Martin writes one episode every season? For Season 2, it was Blackwater. Martin joked, Benioff and Weiss gave me the hardest episode of the season. I think it was their subtle revenge for creating such a difficult-to-produce show. Number 75. The battle used more VFX shots than any other episode, creating hundreds of horses and over 200 ships in post-production, among dozens of other computer-generated creations like soldiers, green wildfire, and even elements of the castle and shoreline. Number 76. Surprisingly, Tyrion keeps his nose. In the books, his nose is chopped off during the Battle of Blackwater, but producers didn't want to digitally remove it in every frame for the rest of the life of the show. Number 77. One more small but important change. On the show, it's Sir Loras Tyrell, Renly's lover, who rides into the battle wearing Renly's armor to honor him. In the books, it was a minor character, Loras's brother, Garland. Number 78. Yes, the Hound is scared of fire. Harkening back to abuse he suffered at the hands of the Mountain, his monstrous older brother, the Hound flees instead of fighting near the wildfire. Number 79. Blackwater became one of the highest rated episodes of the entire series with a record of 3.38 million viewers. Ratings haven't gone down
down since, and major media outlets refer to Blackwater as the episode that made Game of Thrones a bona fide hit. Number 80. Moving on to the lighter side of Game of Thrones, the second season only gets sexually explicit in 8 out of 10 episodes for a total of 7 minutes and 40 seconds, as opposed to season 1, which got a perfect score if you're into that kind of thing, clocking in at 10 out of 10 episodes for a total of 8 minutes and 10 seconds. Number 81. Similarly, the number of instances of nudity decreased from Season 1 to Season 2. There were 20 nude scenes in Season 1 and only 13 in Season 2. Show producers were given props for making the nudity more meaningful as well, like the scenes between lovers Renly and Loras discussing his claim to the throne. Number 82. Maisie Williams refused to cut her hair at first, even though Arya was supposed to be in hiding. She eventually did it out of spite for her wig in Season 1. Number 83. Arya's wasn't the only look that changed, Theon's look took on much more dirt and grime, as if covered in ocean salt and dirt. Number 84. Fans complained in forums about the changes producers made to Daenerys' visit to the House of the Undying. In the show, her visions were cryptic and mysterious, but in the books, they were quite literal representations of her past and future. Number 85. One more incredible update. To make Renly look more kingly, his entire wardrobe was overhauled, including a chest plate with over 800 strips of metal. Number 86. Speaking of wardrobe, even the ex Extras have costumes made from scratch. They have a fitting the day before they start, and then a 12 to 16 hour day the day they shoot. Number 87. We're almost done with season 2 and we've barely talked stunts. Paul Herbert is the stunt coordinator. You won't recognize him, but you've seen his work from doing stunts in Saving Private Ryan to coordinating all the stunts for In Bruges, Les Mis, and a multitude of TV shows. Number 88. C.C. Smith is the Swordmaster, and that is how you pronounce his name, Smith. The job is, well, mastering the sword fights. From giant brawls to one-on-one -on -one battles, Smith organizes it all. Number 89. Season 2 was also notable for the new incest storyline introduced. 20 minutes into the season, we meet Craster, husband and father to a couple dozen women beyond the wall at Craster's Keep. Number 90. Speaking of gross stuff, it was during Season 2 that the media started criticizing the sexual violence on Game of Thrones, pointing to, among other things, Joffrey's brutality toward Roz and the second prostitutes sent by Tyrion. What do you think? Does the show go too far, or is it just doing justice to the books, which are brutal in and of themselves? Number 91. Speaking of brutality, one big change is who first gives Theon the idea to attack Winterfell and destroy all that was dear to him. In the book, it was Ramsay Bolton, and on the show, it's his first mate as he leaves Pike. Number 92. Google Aaron Greyjoy if you're not familiar. In a departure from the books, Theon's uncle was held back from season 2, and his re-emergence will be big. Number 93. In every season, at least one king dies. Season 1 was Robert, Season 2 it's Renly, Season 3, you'll have to check back next week. Number 94. Now for some quick hits. Valor Morghulis, the title of the 10th episode in Season 2, translates as All Men Must Die. The phrase is also a line in the episode, spoken by Jacken in conversation with Arya. Number 95. Ian Glenn, who played Jorah Mormont, became so good at speaking Dothraki, he was able to ad-lib the entire final scene of the season finale. Number 96. Since since dire wolves are known to be much larger than normal wolves, real wolves were digitally composited into scenes for Season 2. To save money, there are only a handful of scenes that include them in Season 2, but man, do they make it count. Number 97. Questions have arose about how Game of Thrones creators are allowed to do awful stuff to children on the show. Well, parents are required on set by law, which is great, but pretty damn awkward for Sophie Turner's parents, according to Dan Weiss. Number 98. According to Benioff, the only time Turner was genuinely afraid was when she she had to sing in season two. Really? All those explicit scenes and humming a little tune is the one that got you? Number 99. Season two marked the final season in which Clark went full on nude on Game of Thrones. The actress took a stance and refused to strip naked after the first two seasons of the show, telling producers, I want to be known for my acting, not for my breasts. Number 100. Speaking of nudity, while season one was given an R16 rating upon its DVD release in New Zealand, season two was strictly branded with an R18 rating, resulting in all those six 16 and 17 year old fans doing a little sneaking around. Number 101. Some fans with too much time on their hands started a petition following season 2 to fire the actor playing Rick on Stark. Luckily, the petition only received 10 signatures. Number 102. The show is known for its multitude of deaths, and season 2 was no exception. There is a bookstore in England called Waterstones that has a dorking section, and they've labeled every death. Number 103. Season 2 saw continued growth for the show. 4 million viewers tuned in to watch the series 2 finale 
finale a new high for the show. Not only that, Thrones celebrated a 1 million viewer increase from its Season 1 finale. Number 104, Game of Thrones Season 2 Blu-ray is still in the top 400 sellers on Amazon four years after its release. Number 105, the Blu-ray editions of Season 2 contain Dragon Eggs, Game of Thrones' version of Easter Eggs, including a special video on the War of the Five Kings. Number 106, Season 2 is also beloved critically. It currently holds a 97% critics rating on Rotten Tomatoes, 14% higher than Season 1. Number 107, at the 64th Primetime Emmy Awards, the show's second season was nominated for 12 awards, and Dinklage was once again the only cast member to get a nomination. However, the show tied Homeland for most Emmy wins of the night. Thanks for watching Cinematica's 107 Facts You Should Know About Game of Thrones Season 2. Like what you just saw? We've got 107 Facts You Should Know About Game of Thrones Season 3 coming out next week. And if you love obsessing over movies and TV, be sure to tell your friends. Like this video and subscribe to Cinematica, where we help you watch smarter.